Good morning, Faith Church. Good to see you on this beautiful Sunday morning. This is the first Sunday of November in 2020, and it is All Saints Day, All Saints Sunday today, as well as our Communion Sunday. So we will be partaking in a lot of different types of worship experiences this morning. We're so glad that you're here and glad that we're able to continue to come together and to worship God. Let's remember who we are, Faith Church. Our mission is to express God's love to all, invite others to know Jesus, and to make faithful disciples. Well, let's get our hearts ready. Let's enter to God's gates with thanksgiving and with praise. Amen. Well, if you're just joining us, welcome to Faith Church this morning. It's now time for our kids. And kids, we have an interesting story for you today. I hope that you are continuing to stay in touch and enjoying your Sunday school lessons. And today we're going to be talking about dirty feet, dirty feet. Let's go to our kids today.
Hello, I'm Phineas, and I want to tell you about Jesus and how much he loved people. Just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his dear friends, he continued to love them right to the end. So Jesus got up from the supper table, set aside his robe, and put on an apron. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the feet of the disciples, drying them with his apron. Jesus came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus said, You don't understand now what I'm doing, but you will understand later. But Peter said, You're not going to wash my feet ever. Jesus answered, If I don't wash your feet, you can't be part of what I'm doing. Master, said Peter, Not only my feet then, wa wash my hands, wash my head. <laughs> if you've had a bath in the morning, you only need your feet washed now and you're clean from head to toe. My concern, you understand, is holiness, not hygiene. So now, you're clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his robe and sat down again. Do you understand what I have just done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, because that is what I am. If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash each other's feet. I did this as an example, so that you should do as I have done for you. If you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. And so, through this powerful event in the Bible, we can see that if Jesus was willing to wash people's feet, then surely we can find ways to serve others like Jesus did. All right, well, I don't know if you knew that Jesus washed people's dirty feet and Jesus asked us to watch each other, wash each other's dirty feet. I think it's more than that. It's a story about us really serving and taking care of each other, and that's what Jesus asked us to do. So why don't we be mindful of that this week? Let's see what we can do to go out of our way to really care for each other and serve one another like Jesus says. Hope you have a great week, kids, and I look forward to seeing you again next time. Well, it's now time for us to prepare our hearts for the sermon today. We will listen to this song, go into a time of prayer, read our scripture, and see what God would have for us today. Let's join together in this song. Thank you. 
Amen. God will take care of us. Let's, let's pray together. Holy God, who calls your people into one beloved community, who teaches us the way of peace through life together, who fills us with visions of your eternal reign, as we now celebrate the communion of saints, pour into our heart the power of Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. We bring to you today the joys and the concerns of our hearts. We give you thanks for all the gifts that you have given us, and we pray for those who are in need of healing and wholeness. We lift up one another as we go through this season of uncertainty in our lives. God, we know deep within our hearts that by the power of your loving presence, you are able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. Pour out your spirit upon us, O God. With your word, enlighten the eyes of our hearts that we might live in hope through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today's scripture is taken from Genesis chapter 1. This is a text that we've been looking at in our Bible study over the last few weeks. And there are some words and phrases that really jumped off the page at me that I thought would be worth us exploring today. So we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 through 31. And I am reading this morning from the Message Bible. This is a story that you're probably all familiar with. And the Message Bible will add a little bit of uh, feeling and heart flavor to the story that, uh, that we all know. God spoke, earth, generate life, every sort and kind, cattle and reptiles and wild animals, all kinds. And there it was, wild animals of every kind, cattle of all kinds, every sort of reptile and bug. And God saw that it was good. God spoke, let us make human beings in our image. Make them reflecting our nature so they can be responsible for the fish of the sea and the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, earth itself, and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. God created human beings. He created them God-like, reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female. God blessed them. Prosper, reproduce, fill earth, take charge. Be responsible for fish in the sea and birds in the air, for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. Then God said, I've given you every sort of seed-bearing plant on earth and every kind of fruit-bearing tree, giving them to you for food, to all animals and all birds, Everything that moves and breathes, I give whatever grows out of the ground for food. And there it was. God looked over everything he had made. It was so good, so very good. It was evening, it was morning, day six. May God add a blessing to the reading of this word today. Our sermon today is keep creation going. Keep creation going. The phrase that stood out to me as uh, we read this in Bible study in the last few weeks was Genesis 1.28. The Message Bible uh, says it this way. These are the words that God gives to the people, to these new humans that are being born. This is their first kind of command and instruction. And this is what he says in the Message Bible, prosper, reproduce, fill the earth, take charge. Now you might be familiar with the King James Version or some other versions that say, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth or fill the earth and subdue it. So different words to describe same basic concepts. And this word reproduce 
really stood out to me. When we look at the previous days of creation in Genesis chapter 1, we see God creating things and he simply speaks things into being. He speaks light into being and he speaks uh, the trees into being and the animals and the sun and the moon and humans and he simply speaks and they appear. There's a Latin phrase that's used to describe this ex nihilo, out of nothing. So out of nothing, God speaks and things are created. But when we look at this first command or this first statement that he gives to these humans that he's just created, he's giving them a command that's very similar to the things that he has been doing. He wants them to create. Now we as humans cannot create like God creates. We can't create out of nothing to simply speak and something comes into existence. Even though we might fantasize about being able to do that, uh, this is something that we just are not able to do. But we are able to keep creation going in, in a way to be a part of the creative process of life. So we reproduce. We take something that's already there and we are able to reproduce out of that. So we see later on the husband and the wife, uh, Adam and Eve, it talks about how the two flesh become one. It talks about how they multiply themselves. On into Genesis chapter 3, we see that they start their first family. And this is on the most basic level. We see two human beings coming together, and then we see them reproducing taking what they have inside and continuing life. Not out of nothing, but out of sharing together and out of taking what's inside, uh, they're able to reproduce. So let's look, this is the, the one word that caught my attention. I'd like for us to look at these four words because I think that they talk about the process of us recreating or keeping creation going in our own lives. And uh, let's look at them kind of one by one. So this first one is the word prosper, or the King James Version says, be fruitful. So I, I thought about being fruitful, and this text jumped uh, into my mind. This is the uh, statement that Jesus makes in John 15 about being fruitful. In John 15, verse 5, he tells his disciples, all those people that are following him, he says, I am the vine... You are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. So we're commanded to be fruitful. And we can see by Jesus' teachings, the way that we bear fruit in our lives is by abiding in the vine. To abide in him. To abide in God. Uh, when this text came up for uh, us to look at in sermons over the last couple years, there is an, an experience, an interesting little experience that I had uh, that, that made me think about something in here. I, I, I like to spend uh, time in my backyard sometimes and just r really pay attention to the, the things that are growing there. And this particular day, I was looking at uh, the branch coming out of the tree or the branch coming out of the, the bush. And one of the things that caught my attention was this text. And it talks about this connection between the branch and its source, the trunk or the vine. Now, if you think about it, if you were to maybe take a microscope and, and to look as closely as possible at where those two things connect, the, the branch and the vine or the branch and the trunk. The question is, where does one end and one begin? Now, if, if you go around and you are, are pruning things in your garden, you're, you're very aware of where the branch and where the vine come together. You don't want to cut into the vine. You don't want to cut too far out from the branch. So you're kind of thinking about where this connection lies. If we are asked to abide in God, that probably means paying attention to the way that we are connected with God. And there's not this, 
this, uh, this wall or this line, this clean demarcation between where the vine and the branch uh, come together. And that's why we can produce fruit because we are actually connected in such a way that we're actually part of the vine. We're an extension of the vine. And, and God is connected to us and feeding life and energy and love through us. And that's what produces the fruit. I think sometimes uh, we see in this text, uh, he talks about the branches that don't produce any fruit. They get cut off and they get thrown into the fire because they, they are not doing what they were designed to do. And this is not a threat. This is simply a statement of fact that if we are not connected with God and abiding in God, we just are not going to produce fruit. We're not going to do what he asked Adam and Eve to do in this story in Genesis 1, and that is to be fruitful and to multiply. In order to do that, we have to abide in God and paying attention to the way that we are connected with God to see that there is part of God in us and part of us in God in this interesting and unique and special connection. So in order to bear fruit, we must abide in God. The second word or phrase is reproduce or multiply. Reproduce or multiply. I thought about a, a story of multiplication. And this is the story of Jesus who is feeding the 5,000. This is a very common story. It's in all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And there is... A, a few little tiny details that are different from one story to the next, but there is something that stands out, and that is this process of how Jesus multiplies these two fish and five loaves of bread from this little boy's lunch, and he ends up feeding over 5,000 people with it. Let's look at Mark chapter 6. Mark 6, 41 and 42. It tells us, taking the five loaves and the two fish... He looked up to heaven, he blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and he divided the two fish among them all, and all ate and were filled. This probably reminds us of communion that we celebrate today. There is a giving thanks and a breaking of the bread, and here we also see that he divides the fish. So before Jesus multiplies this lunch that is given to this little board, before it's multiplied, two things happen. One is the lunch is broken and divided, and then it's multiplied. So maybe we can see this kind of process in our own lives. If we are to multiply and reproduce, whatever it be in our personal lives, in our families, in our churches, maybe there's still this process of being broken, of being divided into parts, and then to be shared. You may have felt literally or, or emotionally broken before or divided into parts, and maybe that's just a part of the process of us being able to be put into a form that can be shared and multiplied to be reproduced. Uh, this, is, this is something that, um, uh, you know, we've always wondered about uh, how Jesus uh, did this miracle. And um, it, it seems that it's through breaking that uh, he is multiplied. We, we wonder about this later on. And we see that this is even a reflection of what we see take place at the cross where Jesus himself, God himself, is broken before he is shared with the world. This next phrase that we see uh, from Genesis, this next concept about us keeping creation going, is to fill or to replenish the earth. There's a story out of 2 Kings, and this is a, a story that... Um, uh, has, has some neat parts to it, so I wanted to share it with you again. Uh, we've shared this in the last few years in a sermon. 2 Kings 4, verses 1 through 7. This is uh, the prophet Elisha and a, a woman who has recently become a widow. 
Uh, the woman uh, has a family that she's trying to take care of. She's poor, and she doesn't know what's going to happen next. The wife of the man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as slaves. Elisha replied to her, How can I help you? Tell me. What do you have in your house? The servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him, shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There's not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, Go, sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what's left. So we can see even here in this story in 2 Kings, there's this principle of taking what is already there and recreating out of it. Now the, the phrase that stands out to me is when he asked this woman to go and collect jars to fill with oil, from her uh, olive oil container, he says, don't ask for just a few. Uh, he had some kind of a intuition that uh, this was going to keep flowing and keep flowing. And so she gets not just a few, and they all are filled. Until, until the last one is filled, then the oil stops uh, from flowing. This is something that I think that we can uh, apply to our own lives as we're looking at how God recreates and reproduces and multiplies and fills through us. We can see that God wants to do a lot with our lives. God wants to recreate so that vessels around us are filled. And just like the prophet says to the woman, don't ask for just a few, that question is posed to us. We have so much that God wants to recreate and share with those around us. And oftentimes I think we might hesitate to bring in too many vessels. We think, oh, surely this little thing can't fill all of those. But this is the miracle of God recreating through us. Maybe we should take these words, don't ask, just for a few, and take it to heart. And then lastly is this phrase, take charge or subdue it. Now, this has to do with being responsible. This is a description of responsibility from Stephen Covey. He says, responsibility is the ability to choose your response. Highly proactive people do not blame circumstances, conditions, or conditioning of their behavior. Their behavior is a product of their own conscious choice based on values, rather than the product of those conditions based on feeling. We're asked to take charge, to subdue, to be responsible for the creation that God has put into place. This is very similar to the serenity prayer. We're asked to change the things that we're able to change and to uh, simply accept the things that we cannot. We're not asked to change the things that we cannot, but we are asked to change the things that we can. That's responsibility. So when we're going through life, part of this creative process of God recreating out of us 
is for us to acknowledge that we have a responsibility, an ability to respond correctly and to change some of those things that God is creating through us. And then there are many things in life that we cannot change that we shouldn't try to. We all are responsible in different ways. Elizabeth Weigel, she writes a lot about the Enneagram and uh, personality types. And she talks about our ability to be responsible and is finding that all of us are responsible in different ways. Let's look at these different ways that we can be responsible. And maybe we can identify with one or more of some of these. Some of us are perfectionists. That means we have to a desire to improve ourself and others and to worry about how things are going. That's one way to be responsible. There are helpers. Some of us are helpers and we try to be there for important people in our lives. Some of us are achievers and we feel responsible for getting ahead in the world and for leading others to get things done. Some of us are romantics and we feel responsible to ourselves for honoring and expressing feelings and values, and for finding beauty in life. Some of us are observers. We feel responsible to ourselves and sometimes to others for determining what is logical. Some of us are questioners. We look for bad things that might happen and try to avoid mishaps. Some of us are adventurers. And we often feel responsible for protecting the environment in which we live and play. And we feel responsible for staying happy ourselves and for making other people happy. Some of us are asserters, and we feel responsible for enforcing the rules and standing up for the truth and justice. And lastly, some of us are peace seekers, and we feel responsible for promoting harmony and fairness. God recreates through us in different ways, and we're responsible for that creation in different ways. And all of these other things are probably done in unique ways based on who we are as uh, his, his children. So to keep God's creation going, we must all abide in the vine, staying aware that we are rooted in God. We must be broken and shared in order to multiply. We must have faith and prepare not just a few vessels to be filled. And we must exercise our ability to respond to circumstances, not out of how we feel in the moment, but by remembering the big picture of God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven.
right, well, welcome back. I apologize that we were disconnected. I, I, I don't know exactly where um, uh, we, we lost track. I got a notification here. It seems like we ran out of space on uh, the device. So we are back. We are preparing our hearts for communion. Uh, those of you who are at home, all of you at this time, uh, if you have your own uh, bread and drink that you would like to partake in, you're more than welcome to use it. And then uh, we also have uh, these uh, kind of, I guess, uh, sealed uh, little elements of bread and, uh, and juice that you're welcome to come to the office and pick up if you haven't already. And this is what we will share together from today. All people of sincere faith, regardless of your religious tradition or church membership, you're invited to share in the Lord's Supper. You may join today by sharing food and drink at home, and we will now pray and bless this meal made sacred by the Holy Spirit that joins us together at the table. We come to this table not because we must, but because we may. We come not because we're strong, but because we are weak. We come not because we have perfect faith, but because we have questions and even doubts. But we come nonetheless because Jesus invites us to come, and we will never be turned away. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You who come to me shall not hunger. You who believe in me shall never thirst. In company with everyone who hungers for spiritual food, we come to this table to know the risen Christ in this memorial of his love. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come open our eyes to the mystery of Christ's presence in these ordinary things in our ordinary lives. May they be for us the very essence of the living Christ in our midst. Amen. As Jesus gathered together with his disciples before he was taken to the cross and they shared in this last meal together, they were in communion. They were in community. They were sharing around the table. He knew about their capacities to be a part of God's ongoing creation. And the multiplication of this word of teaching and example there that he had left with them. And so as we look today in our sermon, he reminded them about being broken, so that they could be multiplied, knowing that this is something he would experience in his own life and that they would experience in theirs, a principle of God's creation that as we recreate, there is a brokenness along the way to healing. So he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat as often as you do in remembrance of me. And as supper was coming to a close, he took the cup and he said to them, this cup is my blood. It is my blood of the new covenant that is shared for you for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink this as often as you do in remembrance of me. If you would please join with me as we pray the prayer of thanksgiving. We give thanks to you, almighty God, for your presence and your purpose, for your loving kindness and your steadfast spirit. May the blessings of this table strengthen our faith, increase our generosity, and unify our hearts through Christ who is our Redeemer. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, this is also All Saints Day. And uh, let me just read to you uh, this is a few sentences taken from the Companion to the Book of Common Worship by the Presbyterian Church USA. And I think that it really is a good summary 
of what we do today on All Saints Day. To rejoice with all the faithful of every generation expands our awareness of a great company of witnesses above and around us like a cloud. It lifts us out of the preoccupation with our own immediate situation and the discouragements of the present. In the knowledge that others have persevered, we are encouraged to endure against all odd. Reminded that God was in the faith, reminding that God was with the faithful of the past, we are reassured that God is with us today, moving us and all creation toward God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. In this context, it is appropriate for a congregation on All Saints Day to commemorate the lives of those who died during the previous year. I'm going to share with you a list of those who in our faith family have passed from this life into that great cloud of witnesses. And let us just take a moment of silence to remember these loved ones and to thank God for the gift that they have been to our lives, how they are a part of us still as a communion of God's saints. As we remember these loved ones in this moment, let's listen to this beautiful song, which is a great reminder uh, in this context, God is in control. As we reflect on how amazing it is to be a child of God, I wanna share with you guys um, an original piece written by a friend of mine. And it speaks about how amazing it is. The things in the Caribbean that we take for granted that we should thank God for, guys. It speaks about God being in control despite everything and because of everything that is happening around us. We know and we can see that God is in control. I pray that you're blessed. Just took a strong Sending my toes as the tide rolls up on the shores and the harmonies of nature surrounds me. I see the mountains covered with trees as the leaves born a blanket. Yes, he is the reason for it all, it all, it 
gets to me It is so amazing how the sunset lights the skies on fire The lovely melodies of the birds on the wire How beautiful the dewdrops on petals of a rose God is in control Dark skies, the flowers, oh, they wither and die. The birds fly away when they sense the rain, but it cannot take away from the fact that, from the fact that, from the fact that it is so amazing how the sunset lights the sky. The battle, battle, battles of a rose. God is in control. Yes, my God is in control. It is so amazing how the sunset lights the skies on fire. The lovely melodies of the birds on the wire. How beautiful the two drops on the battle, battle, battle. As we leave this shared virtual space today, let's make a commitment to stay connected with one another. Let's dedicate our offerings for the mission that God has given us here at Faith Church, and let's enter into this week with God's blessing. Let's pray. Holy One, all that we have comes from you. You bless our lives with the companionship of your people. 
the freedom that comes from forgiveness of sin, the joy of thanksgiving for earth and all its bounty. Turn us toward those in need. In the name of the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior. God, we ask that you give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation to live in hope today and always. We pray this in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing today in the worship service. So glad that you're able to be here. Look forward to joining you again next week. Hope that you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week ahead of you. Take care.